Well, hi there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. <laughs> I read to you from volume one of chapter 38. There are three volumes ahead. I would like to read some poems from chapter 38, volume two, for you. These are a bunch of performance art shows over the years that have been collected into a bunch of books. I didn't tell you before what shows those were from, and I'm not going to tell you what shows. There are different shows. I'm going to read three different ones that have been performed before. This first one is called Military Police. There are times like this when I like to think I'm free of you. I take all other ob obstacles every day. The thought of you never crosses my mind. And sometimes, you know, I have a good day and I face adversity and I accomplish things and, well, I feel good. And it's nice to know that you had nothing to do with my feeling good. I have a lot of things to do today, and I, and I was having technical difficulties, but I had to figure out how to overcome them. And you know, I did everything I could, and I think I ended up ahead of the game. And it had nothing to do with you. And I feel like I've accomplished things today, and I feel like I'm ahead of the game, and it makes me feel good. And it makes me pause and smile, you know. You little prick. It makes me stop and start to smile when I think about all the things that I've done and all the things I can do. And it's all despite you. Oh. This one, totally different show. This one is called Get Me Out of This Cage. You've been trying to censor me for God knows how long. I don't know, maybe you didn't want to hear my views because you didn't believe those views should be expressed. But you never knew what I stood for. You never wanted my voice to be heard because you always thought of me as a possession and not a person. Yeah, I can be a real pain to anybody who doesn't want to hear me. But you know what? People do want to listen. People value the right to speak their minds. And people know that once you take away someone's rights, you take those rights away from everyone. You can just try to leave me like this in a locked cage, but you can try to keep me away from everyone else. But you know, I've been clawing at the roof, and I feel the grooves along the ceiling from all my fighting, because I still have nails on the tips of my fingers, and I know that I can keep clawing, and I can keep fighting, because I know that I have more work to do, and I'll get it done, I tell you. I'll be free again. Your cage isn't airtight. I've seen light from the outside when you've had me trapped, and every once in a while I see shadows, and I'm sure that there are people there. You can't keep me trapped like this forever, because people will hear my screams through the cracks in your precious cage. And, and no, I don't care what kind of cage you put me in, because I'll keep fighting. I'm strong like that, you know. And I don't want to hear what you, that you think I go too far because so much, so as much as you try to oppress me, as much as you try to repress me, I'm supposed to have some inalienable rights here. I've heard the way you think, and I know you think I always have too many rights. And you know, you're a part of the MTV generation, and I know you're addicted to playing video games. Yeah, you'd rather be spending your time interacting with a story and, and a, on a little screen with your precious little joystick than actually have a real conversation with someone. <sighs> but just because you don't feel like reaching out to people doesn't mean you can force me into that cage again. I suppose if you don't think you, if you don't think that you don't want to watch the news, if you don't want to interact with other people, you think, then why should anyone else want to talk to people? If what, if you want that for yourself, fine. If you don't mind giving up your rights because you don't have anything to offer, fine. But the rest of the world doesn't think like you, and we're surely, we surely don't want you ruling over us. Since 9-11, laws have been passed to legally take our rights away. You know, to make us more safe. Fair trade, freedom for perceived safety. 
But I'd rather fly in the face of danger in this country. I'd rather make it on my own without the likes of you if it means I would have more rights and I could be free. I'll look over my shoulder. I'll, I'll watch over myself. I'll do whatever I have to to make sure the likes of you can never stop the likes of me. ordinary park, mind you. Uh, there were no swings or children laughing. Uh, these, there were different children there. Uh, there was recreation, tennis, the pool, and a maze of streets for bicycles and long walks surrounded by rows of prefabricated homes, each one with a little palm tree by their driveway. People drove golf carts around in the park, or large tricycles, or elder couples would walk along together just as it was beginning to turn to dusk, and long shadows from treetops crisscrossed over the streets. In the afternoons, the women would go into the pool, and they would wear hats and sunglasses, lean against the side, swing their legs in the warm water. I remember the summer afternoons when it rained in Florida, and after the rain, I would go out in the puddles with my roller skates, skate through them, feet soaking wet. There was even a street named after me in the park, and at the end of Jan Drive, there was a pond. I spent hours there playing imaginary games, pretending I was grown up, feeding the ducks, watching the fish swim around the rocks at my feet looking for turtles, listening to the wind. Oh, I remember Mr. Worrell, how he would walk out in his driveway every time I was playing tennis across the street. He would watch me, tell me how I was getting better at the game every single time he saw me. And then there was Mrs. Rogers, who lived up the same street from me. She was riding, she saw me once riding my bicycle. Uh, by one day, just before Halloween, and she invited me in to help her carve a pumpkin. Every year, she bought me a Christmas present. The sweetest woman, the most beautiful woman. And there was Ira and Betty Wiggins, who lived on the next street, Sand Drive, with a sign in the front of their house that said, the Wiggins Wigwam. <laughs> They had a hammock on their porch, and it was so beautiful. They had such beautiful art, so colorful on their walls. They had lived in Panama for years. He used to be a doctor. So many stories collected from all of their travel. They both knew so much, and they loved life. Once they saw me and asked me if I wanted to catch a lion, then they went to the side of the road and with a spoon pulled up an ant lion from the top of a sand hill. <laughs> so many secrets. Every night, Ira would be found with his cue holder decorated with Panamanian art at the pool table, playing my father or another man who died years ago. I remember that man telling me that when I was younger, he would watch me on Easter Sunday, me in my pastel dress, by, by myself, spinning, dancing in the street. He remembered me dancing. This was his memory. This was how he thought of me. And I remember the McKinleys, Pete and Lindy, another beautiful pair who talked of Mexico and all the places they'd gone and all the things that they had seen. So many times I would visit them just to hear them talk, and Pete would try to stump me with an intellectual riddle every time I sat over with them. And he would ask me about astronomy, what I had learned in my classes since the last time I visited the park. Sometimes they would take me to their country club, play tennis on, on courts made of clay. How strange it felt on my feet through my tennis shoes. It was like another world there. The park was where I spent my Christmases, my Easters. I remember swimming in the pool one week shy of 13, and my parents told me I was an aunt. <laughs> now I talked to my sister on the phone, and she asks me if I remember so-and-so from Palis Avenue, from Blue Skies Drive. 
The couple with the ornate rock gardens in the front yard, or the snow shovel against the light pole that's with the words rust in peace painted on it, so no wooden white on the metal. Yes, I say, I, I remember them. Well, so-and-so passed away last week, she says. Heart attack. This is what it comes down to, I think. All these memories are slowly disappearing. So many memories where there, where there was palm trees everywhere. It was my other world, my other life, another lifestyle, another everything. This was not an ordinary park, but the children are all so much smarter and still so full of life. So much to teach, so little time. Yeah.